My name is Danny Nemu and this is a talk about mistranslation and interpretation in the service of empire. Today we're going to talk about scripture and the scripture that comes down to us is the King James Version which was translated in 1611. Now in 1611 all sorts was going on in England. There were Catholics, Puritans and Anglicans at each other's throats. The previous decade had seen the gunpowder plot and within living memory tens of thousands of Cornishmen had perished after a revolt which was inspired by the Book of Common Prayer. They marched under the banner, kill all the gentlemen. So translation of scripture was an extremely contentious area at the time and King James asked his scribes to make a Bible that was as uncontroversial and as uncomplicated as possible in order to bring the various disparate factions of England into some kind of accord under one book. Of course, it didn't work. England slipped into civil war, but we got stuck with his chamomile Bible ever since. There have been many ways in which the church authorities have maintained the hierarchies. For example, you can see here the clothes that the Pope wears as he stands on his balcony looking down on you, the hymns which sing about the rich man in his castle and the poor man at his gate, and particularly in church art, where wherever you see Christ, he is completely helpless. He's either in his mother's arms as a baby, you know, skipped through all the events of his life until the stations of the cross where he's whipped and beaten around the church, then he's pinned to a cross and then he's helpless in his mother's arms and dead, in fact, in Pieta. In none of these situations does he have any agency. The images that have power in the church are the Pope, kings and knights and people like that. This is the vaulted ceiling at the cathedral in Siena where you see a long line of lords looking down at you in your place. It almost seems designed to make you suffer in stoic dignity and of course it was. This is a quote from Emma Goldman. Christianity is most admirably adapted to the training of slaves, to the perpetuation of a slave society, in short, to the very conditions confronting us today. Indeed, never could society have degenerated to its present appalling stage if not for the assistance of Christianity. Now, there's no faulting that. That's absolutely true. The Christianity she is talking about is a product of mass manipulation of generations and generations of Christendom. So let's have a look at this Bible, and our approach to scripture is going to be that of a squatter casing the derelict and mostly abandoned edifice of Christian theology, seeing if there are any windows that aren't properly secured that we can get in through to see what's inside and see if we can put what we find to better use. This is uh, me at the first day of Occupy London, and you can see there's a mistake Jesus' placard there, I threw out the moneylenders for a reason. It wasn't moneylenders, it was money changers. And that brings me to a point about the fact that we have forgotten about scripture. I can't understand Western civilization without understanding scripture. Whether it's politics, law, aesthetics, ethics, whatever. The culture which grew out of that church orthodox hierarchy is extremely influenced by that. Now, if you look at my sandwich board, the end is nigh. The end is nigh doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. The line which contains the idea of the end is from Matthew, and it goes like this. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, the word translated as world in the end of the world is aeon. In the Greek and aeon doesn't mean world, aeon means what it means in English, an epoch or a phase or an era. The end of the world is something that one can't really imagine. It would be a horrible thing, nothing to look forward to. Now at the time in 1611 the Puritans wanted the end of the era. They were looking to bring about the end of the monarchy and replace it with the parliamentary era and this was just one of the ways they were trying to bring about the new era. They had just set sail the previous decade to America founding New Jerusalem, and also the previous decade Francis Bacon had published Novum Organum, where he outlines the scientific method, which again brings in a new era, brings us into the scientific era. So this was exactly what the Puritans wanted, and exactly what the king didn't want, obviously. So he did his very best to have that line censored from the Bible. This idea of nigh as well is, uh, is interpreted in a misleading fashion. This is also from Matthew. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is generally taken 
to mean that all we have to do is wait for a little while because it's about to come. But the phrase here, at hand, means very much what it seems to mean. It means it's at hand, it means it's within grasp. And when it's translated in the Bible, this word is twice as often referring to spatial distance than it is to temporal distance. It also means joined. Now the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which seems to be that place where you go where you die, or that place where God is, that eternal zone where the angels sing their heavenly chorals, is not that at all. The word in Greek is oranos. It refers to the sky and everything underneath it. The universe, the world, the aerial heavens, the regions where the clouds and tempests gather, and so on. It doesn't mean that place where you go where you die. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For a start, it doesn't say theirs will be the kingdom of heaven, it says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's not talking about that place, it's talking about right here. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So, I'm going to offer an alternative translation for this nasty piece of scripture. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, more honestly means the sky and everything underneath it is within your grasp. Now, of course, that was not something that the king wanted bandied about as a country slipped towards civil war. So how does one go about seizing that which is within your grasp? One of the virtues which the King James Version tells us is good and Christian is meekness. And we hear this in that nasty line, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Now, there's two errors in that. Firstly, let's look at the word meek in the Hebrew from Psalms, that is anav. It's translated as poor, humble, afflicted, or meek. It tends to mean poor. And when we're talking about meek, we're not talking about meekness in terms of being non-confrontational or shy or retiring or anything like that. And we can see that from other places where it's used, for example, in Numbers. Now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which are upon the face of the earth. Now... You can make many criticisms of Moses, but retiring he was not. He was the original Desert Storm commander who massacred his enemies. Meek, in the way that we understand it, is not a term that can be applied to Moses. The meek shall inherit the earth. This is a deliberate mistranslation in order to keep Christians in their place and keep them patient. Now, the idea of inherit, if we think of an inheritance, we think about waiting patiently for somebody to die or for some natural process to complete its course and then assuming what was there. However, this word, which is Yarash in Hebrew, six times more often as it's translated as inherit, it's translated as possess. It means to seize, to occupy, to dispossess, to take possession of. It can also mean inherit. Finally, this word earth, the earth was a very much more local thing. When we talk about the Eretz Yisrael, we're not talking about the world, we're talking about the land. So I'm going to offer an alternative translation of this, which I think is more in line with the text. And the poor shall occupy the land. This is my friend Jimmy. He was living at St. Paul's Cathedral before the occupiers arrived, and he didn't really know what hit him. He helped out in the kitchen quite a lot. He's living under Putney Bridge now. Ye resist not evil. If you look closely at that word, anti means against. Histemi means to cause or make to stand, to place, to make firm, fix, and importantly, to set or place in a balance. What we're talking about here is to measure force against force. And you can see that in the previous line, which is, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. Now, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth makes a lot of sense in the context of a Jewish settlement where people are mostly more or less equal. In the context of an occupied territory, of an empire, it doesn't make sense at all because the oppressor has far more teeth than you. And this is what happened over and over again in the Jewish homeland. They kept on flinging themselves against Roman garrisons and Roman swords and died in their tens of thousands over and over again. Jesus was counselling a different form of resistance. Antistemi doesn't mean do not resist evil. It, it means don't meet force with force. Don't set yourself firm against force. Do not harden yourself against evil. Because it's stupid. And the verse continues to describe a more intelligent form of resistance. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, if I'm a right-handed Roman, and I'm going to 
punch a Jew. My punch is going to land not on his right cheek, but on his left cheek. Unless I do a spinning back fist. But this is ancient Israel and not Shaolin Temple. The strike we're talking about here is a backhander. And that is what Roman men gave to their women, their children and their slaves. This strike is not a strike to break teeth. This is a strike to establish a hierarchy, to point out who's on top and who's below, who is ordering and who is obeying. Now, the answer to this strike is to turn the other cheek. If you imagine the Roman has now completed his backhander, his right hand is back in his proper place on his right side, and he has a left cheek turned towards him, asking him if he wants to punch, then he should punch man to man. What this has done is it has flipped the hierarchy and put the oppressed in charge of the situation to a degree. The other thing it does in this situation is it tempts the Roman to break his own laws because in Roman law, masters weren't allowed to beat slaves. They were allowed to do backhanders, but they weren't allowed to mete out violence towards them. And the line continues. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now, what we're talking about here is what the Jews used to walk around in. They had a, a big jacket and then a tunic underneath. And in Deuteronomy, we read that a creditor, if he's owed money, is allowed to take the debtor's final item, which is his coat, but he has to give it back at night time because it's his final item and he would use it to sleep in. So the advice is to let him have thy cloak also. That means to go completely naked. Now, it's not a sin in Jewish law to be naked. It's a sin to look upon nakedness. So this is a way of shaming your creditor and showing everybody about the shame that he's put upon you. And of course, this comes down to us as if a man takes your coat, give him your shirt. You know, if someone takes something, give him the rest. And this line about turning the other cheek comes down to us as, you know, oh, turn the other cheek, don't get involved. That's not what it means at all. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Again, we're talking about something very specific in the context of the Roman Empire. A Roman soldier was allowed to compel someone from an occupied territory to walk a mile with his pack, to carry his pack for a mile. However, it was only one mile, it couldn't be two miles. The instruction to go the extra mile, which comes down to us as put your back in, do that extra little bit of work, it doesn't mean that at all. It's another way of flipping the hierarchy. You can imagine these Israelites carrying the packs, going the second mile, and the Roman soldiers chasing after them, not ordering anymore, but asking for their packs back. And you can see in all these three examples, similar themes. You see the idea of shame, you see the idea of flipping the hierarchy, and you also see this controlled escalation of the tension. Now, this is very useful to us in protest situations because we are trying to get a reaction, that's the point, it's disobedient, uh, but maintaining control while we do it, and bearing in mind that the oppressor has all the power of the state behind him, and most of the time, protesters or anarchists don't have all that much backup. There's another thing which all these three lines talk about, and that's the law. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfil. So... What he's talking about here is pushing the law to its extreme, revealing the poison and the nastiness in the person who's using it as a weapon of oppression. So here are my alternative translations of the text. I want you to bear in mind that the Bible is a very complicated and contradicts itself. I'm not trying to tell you what the Bible says, that would be a fool's quest. But I am going to tell you what it doesn't say and offer some translations which seem far more honest to me do not harden yourself against evil everything you see is within your grasp the poor shall occupy the land at the end of the era the angels shall come forth and remove wickedness from goodness now this is translated as remove the wicked from amongst the just it seems like it's people being thrown into the furnace but the text doesn't say that it's an adjective and not a noun it becomes a much more alchemical idea when it's translated in this way. But the translations we've got don't promote such a perspective. They promote meekness, turning of the other cheek, and not resisting evil. And this produces a very peculiar impotence which has afflicted Christendom. You see this, for example, in the attitude of Giles Fraser, who was the canon of St Paul's Cathedral when we arrived there. On the first night, we were surrounded by the police. 
they took a line in front of the pillars of the cathedral. And in the morning, when he came for his service, he said to them, they had no problem with the protesters, but he didn't like these coppers on the steps, and could they please move on? Giles Fraser was certainly not against the occupiers, and he realised quite soon that the church was pursuing a course of action which might end in a violent eviction. And he got so incensed by this that he resigned. And we see this in politics as well. People get really, really pissed off at the situation and they resign as if resignation is the highest form of protest that our culture can produce. Through no fault of their own, Christians have long been targets of manipulative policies. They have tended to behave like sheep and occasionally battering rams going to war for somebody else's agenda. And these approaches to these particular verses, all of these from Matthew, most of them from the Sermon of the Mount, give us a way to engage Christians and hopefully to encourage them to take a stand. This is also something we can offer to anarchists. Having spent quite a long time at Occupy London, I saw lots of righteous anger and lots of good ideas, but not very much in the way of tactics. And Jesus offers some tactical advice there. So righteousness gets a bit of a bad rep. Um, but when you approach scripture, have a look at it. And if something offends you, cut it off or at least dissect it and see what's inside. It can all be done with online searchable Bibles and Strong's numbers where you can basically click around and you can see where one word is used and where it's used elsewhere and, and often it doesn't tally. Finally what I'd like to say in case I've given the impression that I'm trying to tell you what the Bible says, I'm not. The Bible is extremely complex. I'm just trying to tell you what it doesn't say. Blessings, this has been Reverend Nemu. Thank <laughs> you.